All right, we are continuing on chapter nine lectures on slide 82. Restoring forces and Hooke's law. If you stretch a rubber band, the force tries to pull the rubber band back to its equilibrium or unstretched length. Force that restores the system to an equilibrium position is called a restoring force. If you stretch or compress an elastic object, such as a spring, measurements show that the force provided by the spring is opposite to the displacement. If you don't stretch or compress the spring too much, the force provided by the spring is proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. The relationship between the force and displacement of a spring was discovered by Robert Hooke, a contemporary of Newton. Hooke's Law One end of a spring is attached to a fixed wall. The force of the spring in the S direction, so that's what this means, F sub SP, that means the force of the spring, and then with another subscript S means the force of the spring in the S direction. Okay, the S being an axis of a direction like the X axis or the Y axis or whatever. Is the force produced by the free end of the spring, by the free end of the spring. Okay. Not by the spring that's the end that's attached to the wall, but rather by the other end of the spring. Delta S, S minus SEQ, is the displacement from equilibrium. So SEQ is the position of the end of the spring when it's in uh, equilibrium position. S itself is the uh, position of the spring at any time or any point in this problem we might be encountering. So if it's uh, if SEQ is three and S, we, if we stretch it two inches, then S would be five. Then delta S would be the two inches that it is stretched. All right. If it's compressed, then S may be uh, one, and then one minus three would be negative two if it was compressed. And Hooke's law says this, and we, we encountered this in our calculus two class in the in the application section. That the force of the spring in the s direction is equal to negative k times delta s. So k is the spring constant that is unique to each spring. How stiff or how uh, what's the opposite of that? How rigid or how non-rigid, slinky like. There's probably a better word for that. Uh, the spring is. The minus sign is the mathematical indication of a restoring force. The constant K is called the spring constant of the spring. So here is uh, the negative K and what it looks like on a graph. Notice in this graphic here it shows us that um, the delta S is greater than zero when it's stretched. And so the negative sign at the beginning of this would show that if you set up your diagram like this, the force is to the left, um, trying to restore it back to its equilibrium position. Notice when it's compressed, delta S is negative. It's less than zero. And which kind of, with this, uh, that delta S being negative and the negative sign in front of the whole expression makes it become positive which indicates that the force direction is to the right. And here, obviously, there is no stretch or, or, uh, or compression, so the delta S would be zero, which would make the whole spring force be zero as well. Quick check 9-9. Nine, nine. The restoring force of three springs is measured as they are stretched. Which spring has the largest spring constant? Okay, I'm gonna guess A because if you think of, if you if we look at it like this, you know, delta x. Uh, just, well, let's just look at any at any point. Let's look at just right here. Here, the delta x is the same for each spring. The force of C is less than the force of B, which is less than the force of A for that particular delta x. And so, since the force is equal to negative k delta x if this is held constant but the force is greater then the delta the, the k is the thing that must be greater okay so yeah yeah so 
the way they're explaining it is probably even more simple. It's just the fact that it has the steepest slope. So if we look at F equals AK delta X. If this is the thing that varies, the K is the constant, then the K is really the slope, right? That's really the slope of a, of a linear equation. So K is the slope, so the thing with the steepest slope has, would be the biggest K. All right, figure 9.8, this is example 9.8. Pull until it stops. Figure 9.18 shows a spring attached to a 2 kilogram block. Sorry, not pull, pull it until it slips. The other end of the spring is pulled by a motorized toy train that moves forward at 5 centimeters per second. The spring constant is 50 newton meters, newton per meter, and the coefficient of static friction between the block and the surface is 0.6. The spring is at its equilibrium length at t equals zero seconds when the train starts to move. When does the block slip? When does the block slip? Okay. We would say that the block would slip when the force pulling it to the right is greater than the frictional force which would be opposing that. In other words, it would be pulling to the left. So let's just make that uh, dynamics thing right here. We got friction force pulling to the left, which will equal F in mu, right? F in mu, or the normal force, times mu. And then to the right, we have the force of the spring. All right. And the force of the spring equals uh, negative K delta X. All right, so we also obviously have gravity and uh, the normal force. So what is the force of friction? Um, we need to figure out the normal force, which is going to equal the gravitational force. The gravitational force equals the equals uh, the normal force, so it's going to equal uh, mg, which in this case is uh, two times nine point eight, which is uh, um, nineteen point six. So, the normal force is 19.6, so the frictional force is equal to 19.6 times the coefficient of static friction, which is going to be 0 0.6. Static friction because the block is not yet slipping. Um, let's see, 19.6. is 11.76 so now the thing will slip right when the spring force is equal to that that's when it will just begin to be on the verge of slipping so let's set the, the spring force equal to that and so the spring force being uh, I don't think the negative sign is going to matter in this case. Um, we could keep it on there or not. We're just really looking for the delta x. And delta x could be positive or negative. We're still going to give the same answer. Whether it's a negative or a positive, we're going to say it's when the spring is this much stretched. So uh, uh, delta x, so, so yeah, delta x, 11.76. K in this case it gives us is 50. So divide, and we get delta x equals 
point two three five two. Point two three five two what? Meters. Because that's our units. Um, which would be like twenty three point fifty two centimeters. If we wanted to look to look at it like that. Um now it wants to know when, right? So one answer to that question might be when the spring is stretched, uh, or when the train has traveled, same difference, twenty three point five two centimeters. But if it wants to know when, if it if we really take that word if it's serious about the word when, the meaning time, then we have to use the speed of the train to figure out when it gets that far. So this is where we could say, um, right, for, this, for the, you know, A equals zero, V, F equals uh, zero, T plus V, I, and X, F equals zero, equals V sub by T plus X I where X I could be zero. So in this case X F is just uh, what we're looking for. Um, no X F is actually what we already know. X F is 23.52. V is 5. Notice I'm working in centimeters. Uh, since both of these are in centimeters I can work in centimeters. Now, I could also work in meters. I could go back to my meters here, then I could convert this to meters per second, and that would be a fine way to do it too. Maybe that's the safest way to do it, but I know I kind of know that I can do that here because both of these are in centimeters, so it will be fine. So 5t divided by 5, and the time will equal 0.2. Four point seven, basically. So in four point seven seconds, when the train, after the train starts to move, is when the block will begin to slip. Let's make sure we got that right. Yep, 4.7 seconds. Good deal. All right, stick slip motion. Earthquakes are an example of stick slip motion. Tectonic plates are attempting to slide past each other, but friction causes the edges of the plates to stick together. Large masses of rock are somewhat elastic. Somewhat elastic and can be quote unquote stretched. Eventually the elastic force I would say stretched or compressed. Eventually the elastic force of the deformed rocks exceeds the friction force between the plates. When that happens that's when the slip occurs and it's pretty violent, relatively violent. An earthquake occurs as the plates slip and lurch forward. The slip can range from a few centimeters in a relatively small earthquake to several meters in a very large earthquake, which you can see the results of that here. All right, the work done by springs. Shown is a spring acting on an object as it moves from initial position SI to final position SF. The spring's work can be computed by integrating uh, work equals the integral of what we've already said before. The force of the spring, in this case, is what the is the force function here. So the force of the spring being negative k delta x or delta s in this case. The s is what is uh, is where it, the, the variable of integration is s. It, so we're integrating over the position. Uh, as the position changes. So the K is not a part of that. K is a, it's just some constant. So that's why they were able to factor the K out of the integral. Okay. So now it's just the delta S where delta S is the uh, final position of the spring minus its original position or equilibrium position. 
the solution to this integral, um, as you can figure out for yourself, if you do it, you do a little calculus and do that integral, what's it going to be? It's going to be, if we treat these as separate terms, as separate integrals, it'll be s squared over 2 or 1 half s squared minus, same thing over here, s e q squared over 2 or 1 half s e q squared. And then the k, put the k in them, and this is what you've got. That's just uh, calculus coming up with a formula for the work done. Uh, by a spring. This to me looks very familiar. It looks a lot like the kinetic energy um, formula. Like the work, external work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Well here it's equal to the change in the work done by the spring which is going to add also change the energy of the system which we'll talk about more in more detail later. Thermal energy. The macroscopic motion of the system as a whole is given in this figure. The whole system is moving forward or moving in some direction. But this is in this diagram we have the microscopic motion of the atoms of all the little molecules or atoms or electrons or whatever you might say inside of the system or inside of the object or whatever the system might be. So you got not only the, the motion of the entire object, but the, the motion of the, all the little pieces within the object. Figure A shows a mass M moving with a velocity V with macroscopic kinetic, macro means the big, the, the high level, right? The, the overall macroscopic kinetic energy, one half M V squared. Figure B though is a, is a microphysics view of the same object. Micro meaning the little small picture, the small detail, more detailed things of what's going on inside. The total kinetic energy of all the atoms, we might say is K micro. The total potential energy of all the atoms is U. Remember U is the symbol for potential energy. U micro. The potential energy is the energy uh, from that's associated with position. So the thermal energy of the system is equal to the Microkinetic energy, meaning all the movements of all those atoms, the kinetic energy of all the movement plus U micro, meaning all the potential energy of all those atoms in relationship to each other. All right, which is think of that. Think of that as that U micro is a lot of springing action. So as the things move, they have uh, bonds that are stretched or compressed or whatever the entire time. So these things are changing, but they're changing kind of in regards to one another. So as U decreases, K increases, or as K uh, decreases, U increases. All right, so you can see that in this picture here. Atoms in motion, each has a kinetic energy as it moves, but also as it moves, it is, cha it is changing the potential energy due to the molecular bonds, which, which is kind of modeled as spring forces. Uh, molecular bonds stretch and compress, and that gives potential energy. Quick check 910. A tow rope pulls a skier up the slope at constant speed. What energy or transfers, what energy transfer or transfers is taking place? Okay, so the fact that it is at, it's towing it at a constant speed, all right, the, the, the force, the rope is applying a force and it's over a distance so we know that work is being done by that tow rope. What is that work transferring itself into as far as energy is concerned? Um, it won't be kinetic energy because it says constant speed. So kinetic energy is remaining the same because kinetic energy is related to velocity. So what is it then? Well it says up the slope so that means its position is changing relative to to uh, the, the gravitational pull of the earth. So that's again kind of like the, the almost like a spring force itself. The potential energy is changing then. But also we might also say that it's also going to thermal energy as well because of the uh, little bit of friction between the skis and the snow. So I think the answer is both A and C.
All right. Dissipative forces. As two objects slide against each other, atomic interactions at the boundary transform the kinetic energy K macro into thermal energy in both objects. So as atoms at the interface push and pull on each other right here at these points of contact. The spring-like bonds stretch and store potential energy. The spring-like bonds right here between the this object and this object, the blue and the brown, stretch. And so that's storing poten potential energy in the molecules of these two objects. The potential energy is transformed into kinetic energy when the bonds break. So when the bond here breaks, that put that makes these things go into more motion, which then causes more motion for all these other ones, and increases the kinetic, the micro internal kinetic energy of the object, which in overall is making a change in the thermal energy of the object, as we saw uh, back here. Right here is how you should think about that mathematically. All right. Kinetic friction is a dissipative force. There's two objects sliding against each other. The atomic interactions that bound transform into the kinetic macro energy, uh, which um, that energy is transformed into the thermal energy. So the so the overall kinetic energy of an object that is moving. Okay, this big object is moving, but it is moving against this big object this has a overall kinetic energy which is then stored so because of the friction friction is kind of the connection here increases the heat here and here okay which we would call that a transfer of energy from kinetic energy into thermal energy and as that thermal energy in both objects rise the kinetic energy uh, of the entire object will dissipate, meaning it's going to slow it down. That's why kinetic friction is a dissipative force. Dissipative forces. The figure shows a box being pulled at a constant speed across a horizontal surface with friction. Both the surface and the box are getting warmer as it slides. So change in thermal energy is equal to the force of friction times the distance over which that friction, that force of friction is acting. That's what delta S is. Dissipative forces always increase the thermal energy. They never decrease it. They always increase the thermal energy. They never decrease it. So this diagram says the system is, is the box plus the surface. So this box is being pulled from here to here and by this tension and so this friction is counteracting that the entire way which is going to increase the thermal energy so the thermal energy is going to change directly proportional to that force of friction and it's equal to the force of friction times that delta s distance right there the work done by the tension increases the thermal energy of the box and the surface because the work done by the tension force is what causes the 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 friction force to do work also, which then transfers into thermal energy there. Right, example 910, increasing kinetic and thermal energy. A rope with 30 newtons of tension pulls a 10 kilogram crate 3 meters across a horizontal floor, starting from rest. The coefficient of friction between the crate and the floor is 0.2. What is the increase in thermal energy? What is the crate's final speed? Okay. Um, I think, again, more than one way to skin this cat. Um, we could uh, do dynamics, uh, some of the forces to figure out the acceleration. Then from the acceleration, we figure out the final speed. But let's try to do it the work and energy principle way. First of all, um, we got to answer the question about the thermal energy. The thermal energy, uh, the thermal energy will equal the 
the work done by friction. So the work done by friction will equal the friction force times the distance over which that friction force acts. So let's see here. We got a free body diagram would be 30 newton force pulling this way. Friction force will be pulling that way. Uh, friction force will equal the normal force times mu. The normal force is going to be equal to the gravitational force in this case because there's no slope. Gravitational force is 10 times 9.8, which is 98, which is going to equal the normal force. So the friction force is going to equal 98 times 0.2, plus 0.2 is the coefficient of friction. And that is what? 98 times 0.2. I think that's 19.6. Yeah, 19. 19. 19. 19.6. So the work done by friction is going to equal 19.6, that's the force of friction, times the distance, which is 3, which is 58.8. So that is equal to the increase in thermal energy. All right, now, since we've already got the work done by friction, Let's just find the work done by the by the rope. The work done by the tension is going to be 30 newton force times the distance 3, which is 90. So the overall work, the overall external work done on that object by these two external forces is going to be, the, you know, this one is going to be a negative force, a dissipative force. This is going to be a positive work done. So this is negative work. This is positive work. So 90 minus 58.8. We can say the network, network, get it, all right. The network is equal to uh, 31.2. And remember, the, 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 the work equals the change in kinetic energy, or 1 half m vf squared minus vi squared where vi is zero so it's just vf squared in this case and then we can solve for vf just multiply by two divide by ten take the square root we get vf uh, we get vf equals 2.5 that's the final answer there 2.5 meters per second So the way the book explains it, we get, we get the same answer. They say that the work done by that tension force is 90 joules. Uh, 59 joules of that, the 58.8, goes toward increasing the thermal energy rather than the kinetic energy. So the change in kinetic energy is what's left over from that, which is 31. And from, then from there, they figure out the final velocity doing what we did. Power. Work is a transfer of energy between the environment and the system. Transfer of energy between the environment and a system. All right, the environment would include anything outside of that system, like a tow rope or a person or something outside of that object or the system of objects. In many situations, we would like to know how quickly the energy is transferred. The rate at which energy is transferred or transformed is called the power, P. The rate at which energy is transferred or transformed is power. So it's the power is the change in energy over the change in time, or speaking in a calculus way, DE, DE DT. The SI unit of power is the watt. The what? Yes, the watt. <laughs> the watt, which is defined as uh, 1 watt equals 1 joule per second. One newton meter per second. One kilogram times meters per second squared uh, times meters per second. Okay, anyway. The English unit of power. So this is the SI unit of power. The English unit of power is the horsepower, HP. 
and one horsepower is 746 watts. Examples of power. This kind of give you gives you a uh, little bit more feel for what we're talking about when we're talking about power. The light bulb has about a hundred watts. An athlete has about 350 watts. So 3.5 times the power of a light bulb, which is about a half of a horsepower. A gas furnace would be 20,000 watts. And uh, just divide that by 756 or whatever. What was the number again? 756? 746. Divide that by 746 to get the horsepower. So the light bulb having 100 watts of power means that the electric energy is the light and thermal energy at 100 joules per second. It turns electric energy into light and heat at the rate of 100 joules per second. For an athlete, the chemical energy of glucose and fat, so in other words from your diet, goes toward mechanical energy at that rate, the rate of 350 watts per second, 350 watts, or 350 joules per second, which is what a watt is, which is a half a horsepower. Gas furnace, gas furnace means that chemical energy of gas burning goes to thermal energy at 20,000 watts. All right, power. When energy is transferred by a force doing work, power is the rate of doing work, dW dt. All right, so dE dt is what it said earlier, dE dt, but energy and work are really the same thing. So it's also dW dt. If the particle moves at velocity v while acted on by a force f, the power delivered to the particle is force times velocity, or the force vector times the velocity vector. If they are not directly in the same direction, then you have to either do the dot product or do the force magnitude times the velocity magnitude times the cosine of the angle between those two things when they're put tail to tail. All right, quick check 911. Four students run up the stairs in the time shown. Which student has the largest power output? So if you just think of the power as the, the work over time, where work is force time and distance, this student is doing his force of his weight up 10 meters. Um, the, the, the weight, you know, is M times 9.8. But 9.8 is going to be the same for all four of these, so you just factor the 9.8 out and don't worry about it. So just think of this as 80 times 10, and then divide it by 10 seconds, which is 80. Well, this is going to be 80 times that same 10, but only divided by 8, so that's going to be greater. Because it's divided by less of a time, so it's greater power. Same amount of work, less amount of time, that's greater power. This is going to be a uh, less of a force over the same distance and the same time. So because the force is less, B is still bigger. Now D is 80 kilograms times 20 meters. Well, that's going to be twice the work done by this guy. But it's going to be divided by more than twice the time. So this is actually going to be less power than A. So B is going to be the best answer there. And you could, you know, do the calculator and get the exact amount of power for each of these to, to compare it but to do it quickly uh, would be the logic we just said all right example 9.11 this is the last example of this unit power output of a motor a factory uses a motor and a cable to drag a 300 kilogram machine to the proper place on the factory floor what power must the motor supply to drag the machine at a speed of 0.5 meters per second. The coefficient of friction between the machine and the floor is 0.6. So remember, uh, power is work or energy over time. 
and uh, work, where work is force times distance over time. Well, if you do the D over T and kind of group it together, that's force times D over T is velocity. So force times velocity is also equal to power. Um, the force is going to be the force that needs to, uh, that is needed to overcome that friction. And it's going to drag it at a speed of 0.5 meters per second. That's, that's no change in speed. That's constant speed. So it's a, it's a constant velocity there. So that if it's constant speed, then, uh, then the, the force of the cable that the motor is using to pull is going to have to direct, uh, is going to have to equal, exactly equal the force of friction for it to do it at a constant speed. So if we calculate the friction force, then we'll know the force of the motor. So the force of friction is equal to F and mu and F and F, F sub n is going to equal the gravitational force um, because it's not up a slope or anything. So it's going to equal the gravitational force which is just going to be 300 times 9.8 and then times mu being 0 0.6 which equals 1764 now take that force multiply it by the velocity 0.5 meters per second and we get 882 882 watts is the power output of that machine okay you can look here and they have the same answer here that is it if you want to look over these summary slides feel free to Alright, good luck on chapter 9 homework and I'll see you soon.